Greetings, my dear friends around the world and all the other listeners of this channel, Bible, Biblical History or Bible History, however you want to call it anyway. Now it's the night, December 24th to December 25th, as you can well imagine, the night that many people celebrate as the happiest night or the most joyous night, because supposedly on this night Jesus Christ was born. I've already provided you plenty of proofs in other programs that uh, Jesus Christ, there was no way that he could be born in winter, and I've given you plenty of resor- plenty of resources to <laughs> search if you want to, or plenty of sources to consider as you contemplate the meaning, possibly the meaning, and the uh, implication of keeping Christmas, because there must be an ap- implication. In other words, if Christ was not really born on this night, then something is wrong, and I've just uh, I just watched uh, watched the uh, the Vatican Midnight Mass anyway. I do, I do it every every single year just to see how that thing and all that uh, pompous procession proceeds. Because uh, every year there seems to be something interesting uh, to see. And every time, every year, I'm just renewing my awareness of how useless is that kind of mass that actually means nothing. The implications, I say, because if Christ was not born on this winter, on, on this winter, <laughs> winter night, then something is wrong with your celebration, whether you realize it or not. Something doesn't make sense there. In any case, uh, what doesn't make sense uh, is that God never commanded keep you at Christmas. The New Testament has no date of Christ's birth. But it does provide us the uh, clues about the season where he was born. And that would be the autumn, never winter. And plus, the most important implication in spiritual sense, my dear friends, is the fact that you keep something that is pagan in origin, that makes you pagan, and that makes you uh, a worshipper, a pagan worshipper, rather than uh, a, a true Christian. That's the implication. So... On this night and um, tomorrow, interesting, it will be Sunday. So uh, I guess a double double holiday for uh, Protestants and Catholics anyway. Or former Protestants because I don't know what they're protesting anymore. Or who are they protesting against. Because uh, in the past they at least had papacy or popery to protest about. But now nowadays they don't protest against the Catholic Church and its rights anymore. Besides, they have no reason to protest against the Catholic Church because, you see, they are keeping exactly the same customs and holidays like the Catholic Church. And all of those holidays and customs from weekly day of rest, Sunday, and to all of these annual holidays like Christmas, Easter, Halloween, etc., etc., are totally unbiblical. Have nothing to do with the will of God and have nothing to do, have nothing to do with Christ Himself let alone with the apostolic church, let alone with the early Christians, anyway. So, in many parts of the world, people celebrate this holiday today. But you know that this holiday, as I said, was celebrated before Jesus was born, and much, 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 much into the past before Jesus was born. And depending on where, you know, it was observed, the season had some different names, indeed, and different times, because the uh, Orthodox world... Uh, follows another calendar so the orthodox christmas comes 13 days after the catholic one and uh, different names in the past that this season was uh, known uh, known for or known uh, or known about uh, is uh, the one is season festival season called saturnalia and the second one is called yuletide So the real reason for the season was to worship the sun god and celebrate the birth of the sun god, not really uh, uh, to celebrate Jesus Christ. The Catholic Encyclopedia, so the Encyclopedia of the Church, which is the leader in celebrating Christmas and whose um, uh, midnight mass you can always watch every single year now over internet. Uh, This is the report of the Catholic Encyclopedia. Uh, Mithraism. Here is a definition in this source about Mithraism. A pagan religion consisting mainly of the cult of the ancient Indo-Iranian sun god Mithra. It entered Europe from Asia Minor after Alexander's conquest, spread rapidly over the whole Roman Empire at the beginning of our era. The origin of of the cult of Mithra dates from the time that the Hindus and Persians still formed one people, 
for the god Mithra occurs in the religion and the sacred books of both races, in effect in the Veda, Vedas and in the Avesta. In Vedic hymns he is frequently mentioned and is nearly always coupled with Varuna, but beyond the bare occurrence of his name, little is known of him. It is conjectured that Mithra was the rising sun, Varuna the setting sun, or Mithra the sky at daytime, Varuna the sky at night, or the one the sun and the other the moon. In any case, Mithra is a light or solar deity of some sort. And of course, the Catholic Encyclopedia provides the uh, sources from which it got all of this information. Sources are Rig Veda, uh, chapter 3, page 59. Also the uh, religion Dies Veda, published in Berlin by Oldenburg in 1894. Then here is another definition of Helios, Mithra. It's one God. Sunday was kept holy in honor of Mithra. The 25th December was observed as his birthday, the Natalis Invicti, the rebirth of the winter sun, unconquered by the rigorous rigors of the season. Its foremost apostles were the legionaries, hence it spread first to the frontier stations of the Roman army, says the Catholic Encyclopedia. Mithraism was emphatically a soldier religion, uh, and uh, the source of all of this is, again, Catholic Science Encyclopedia, Volume 10, published in 1911 in New York. Then the Catholic Encyclopedia continues again about Mithra and this deity. Mithra identif identified with the Invincible Sun. They also held Sunday sacred and celebrated the birth of the Sun on the 25th of December, the same day on which Christmas has been celebrated since the 4th century at least. The 4th century, of course, when it was... Uh, firmly established in the nominal Christian church by none other but the Constantine the Great and his first ecumenical council of Nicaea in third, uh, 325. Uh, here is the, uh, here is one, 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 uh, quote from Franz de Mo uh, Cumont, whom I mentioned in my other source, I mentioned in my other, 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 other message, page 166, 193, 196 and 197. It appears certain that the commemoration of the Nativity was set for the 25th of December because it was at the winter solstice that the rebirth of the Invincible God, the Natalis Invicti, was celebrated. In adopting this date, which was universally distinguished by sacred festivities, the ecclesiastical authority purified, in some measure, the profane usage which it could not suppress. The only domain in which we can ascertain in detail the extent to which Christianity imitated Mithraism is that of art. The Mithraic sculpture, which had been first developed, furnished the ancient Christian marble cutters with a large number of models which they adopted or adapted. Now here is a quote from the uh, book called Early Church History to AD 313, second edition, published in 1912 by Macmillan. Uh, its author is Henry Melville Watkin. <coughs> and we can be thankful to the uh, University of Michigan, which digitized this in November 13, 2008. Uh, we're quoting now from this, I'm quoting now from this source, from page 140. There was a true moral element in the worship of Mithra, the all-seeing, the author and protector of life, Mithra the purifier, the giver of immortality. A great Catholic church of Mithra overspread the lands from Persia to Britain, especially along the great rivers where the legions lay. It had regular and irregular clergy, ascetics and mendicant friars, and diverse other uh, orders of faithful men. It had regular divine service three times daily and a yearly round of festivals culminating in the birthday of Mithra on December 25th with meetings for worship and processions of noisy votaries. Now as far as Mithraism and Christmas go, dear friends, here is another claim that I'm just going to write now from uh, the, the, the work uh, The Origin of Christmas. By Sinai A. By the way, all of these, uh, all of these quotes and stuff you can find on internet. So um, the truth is not somewhere up in heaven that you would say that somebody needs to go up there and 
take you down for you. It's not across the seas, so that you would say that someone needs to travel that far to give you. You know, the truth is now readily available, and since much of the humankind has got internet access, you can all check it out. You can all check it out on internet, uh, not only on my YouTube channel, but on all kinds of various sites anyway. So, here is what Sina A, the origin of Christmas, says. The origin of this festivity is presumed to be Mithraic and about 4,000 years old. Mithra was the god of light, just like they keep calling this, <laughs> the night of light. And the night of light kept saying, I kept hearing this in the Vatican Mass. They just kept, kept saying that the light has come to this world on this night. And this is the night of the light, you know. Interesting enough, the... Uh, Tomorrow should be, I think, the last, uh, or, 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 no, or in, on Monday, uh, we're also having, uh, uh, on this year, interesting enough, it's the week of the, of the Festival of Light, Jewish Festival of Light, Hanukkah. So somehow these two, uh, celebrations, uh, basically converged on this year, which is very interesting. And now it's, I think it's the seventh, this should be now the seventh, no, this should be the sixth. The sixth, actually, uh, night of Hanukkah. The seventh will be tomorrow, and then on Monday, I guess, it's going to end because, as far as I remember, it lasts for eight days. So, in any way, God, you know, the God of Light, Mithra, was the God of Light. You see, and I kept hearing in this midnight mass at, at Vatican all the time. This is the night, night of ni night of the light, the uh, uh, night of the light, and the. Uh, 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 <laughs> They would say they spoke in Italian, uh, the Santissima, the, 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 the most holy night. And Pope Francis spoke it out loud and so did others. By the way, Pope Francis looks very exhausted and he was being pushed in a wheelchair. So I wonder how, uh, how much longer is he going to live and serve as a Pope? Anyway, he is the first, uh, Jesuit Pope. Interesting. So I wonder if the next one will be also picked up by the Jesuits or some other kind of, some other kind of, uh, order because Catholics have got all kinds of orders, you know, male and female orders anyway. And in any case, Mithra was the god of light in ancient Iran. The symbol of Mithra is sun. Iranians use the symbol in their flag for at least, uh, for at least the last 2500 years. The period of 17th to 24th of December was the duration of this feast. The 21st of December which is the solstice of winter, is still celebrated in Iran. It is called Yalda, and it represents the victory of light over darkness, which symbolizes the triumph of good over evil. Mithraism was brought to Europe by Greek soldiers after the defeat of the Persians by Alexander the Great. Prior to the dominance of Christianity, the Romans celebrated this festivity during the 25th of December to 6th of January. Mithraism gained favor by the Emperor Commodus and Julian, and in 307, Diocletian built a temple on the Danube River dedicated to Mithra. Mithra is spread throughout Europe, from Rome to the province of Numidia of the, in North Africa, up to England and Scotland. End of the quote. So, so who is the uh, origin, originator, the uh, source, the propagator or promulgator of this cult of Mithra? Well, of course, as we see, Rome. Rome, you can very with a total peace of conscience, we can call all of these various uh, so-called Christian celebrations, we can call them Roman holidays as well, because that's what, what they really are, even though the Rome inherited, the Rome and the Roman church inherited it from other cultures, you know. Well, when I say other cultures, I mean other heathen cultures, cultures that are not serving the true God. Now, you will find it interesting that the late Baptist minister and civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr., also concluded that uh, this was so in some of his early theological research from 1949 to 1950. And here is a surprising information for some of you Protestants who may uh, appreciate this uh, this person. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. writes, When Mithraism is compared to Christianity, there are surprisingly many points of similarity. Of all the mystery cults, Mithraism was the greatest competitor of Christianity, that Christians did not, did copy and borrow from Mithraism cannot be denied, he says. Here is another quote from him. Mithraism was suppressed by the Christians sometime in the later part of the 4th century AD, but its collapse seems to have been due to the fact 
that by that time many of its doctrines had been adopted by the church so that it was practically absorbed by its rival. So no more there was rivalry. Now we know the church, the Christian church adopted it and that was it. The church couldn't conquer it, so they just joined it. <laughs> uh, and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. continues, The church made a sacred day out of Sunday, partially because of the resurrection. But when we observe a little, when we observe a little further, we find that as a solar festival, Sunday was the sacred day of Mithra. It is also interesting to notice that since Mithra was addressed as Lord, Sunday must have been the Lord's Day long before Christian use. Lord Day or uh, Dia Domini in, in Latin, I think. Uh, uh, Luther, Matthew, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. continues, December the, it's also, it is also to be noticed that our Christmas, December 25th, was the birthday of Mithra and was the only taken over in the 4th century as the date, actually unknown, of the birth of Jesus. To make the picture a little more clear, we may list a few of the similarities between these two religions. And here is his, here, three similarities in this quote that I'm having. Both regard, the first quote, both regard Sunday as a holiday. Second, December 25th came to be considered as the anniversary of the birth of Mithra and Christ also. And the third similarity, baptism and a ritual meal were important parts of both groups, both Mithraistic believers and obviously those who were nominal Christians. In summary, writes Martin Luther King Jr., we may say that the belief in immortality a mediator between God and man, or the observance of certain sacramental rites, were common to Mithraism and Christianity. Now, of course, you'll find all these quotes on the internet, but anyway, the papers of Martin Luther King Jr., Volume 4, uh, it's, uh, it was published in 1992 by University of California Press, and on pages 222, 224-307-309, You'll find all of these quotes about Mithraic culture uh, in Iran and Mithraic cult and what it implied. You see, again, the implication, as I said, is that if you keep something that is not Christian and has nothing to do with Christ and the apostles, then you're keeping something that is of the other religion. And you might remember that the first commandment out of all the ten, the very first commandment says that idolatry or worship of foreign gods is strictly forbidden. So the implication is that you, if you celebrate something that is of pagan origin, and secondly, if you celebrate something that uh, is actually breaking of the first commandment, then can you consider yourself a commandment keeper? Can you consider yourself a Christian? Because Christ says this uh, in the Bible, that if we love him, that's in John 15, I think, if we love he will keep his commandments. Now, he never kept Christmas. We don't even have the record of, he, of the day when he was born. We know he was not born in winter, that's for sure. So, therefore, my dear friends who are still sticking with some phony arguments for Christmas, it's time really to revise your attitude and revise your uh, convictions. Are your convictions based on the authority of God? who has his word called the Bible, or is your faith uh, built on the authority of men? Let the thing be worse, uh, on the authority of pagan men, on the authority of pagan, on the authority of paganism. You may say, well, who cares? Well, think about it. Think about it. The, 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 the central verse in the Bible says, Curse the one who relies on man and not upon God. It's called from a psalm. It's the central verse in the Bible. Secondly, if you're keeping something that has nothing to do with Christ, then what are you keeping? <laughs> are you then honoring Christ Jesus, the light of the world, as they say, or are you honoring Mithra, the God of light, the ancient uh, Asiatic God? And after all, what's the implication for your mental state of mind and your spiritual state of mind or your spiritual state of affairs? 
if you celebrate, spiritually speaking, something that's actually pagan, or paganism is, the author of paganism is not God, but Satan. So if, you, if you're celebrating something that is of Satan origin, then what would be the consequences? What kind of blessings can you expect in your life? from God of the Bible, you cannot expect any blessings. You can only expect the curses that you will be bring, bringing upon yourself for practicing paganism and invoking Satan rather than rather than God. So, during the latter time of Clement, when Roman bishops such as uh, Callistus, for example, gave power, apparently the Romans compromised in many ways, and thus many associated with the church uh, those who were part of the church, they chose to celebrate the Roman Saturnalia, which seemed to have been related to the Yalta of Mithraism in Iran. Now, this was condemned by uh, such church fathers, so-called church fathers, as Tertullian. Tertullian writes on Idolatry, chapter 10, and it's published on uh, Anti-Nicene Fathers, volume 3, the Minervalia are as much Minervas as the Saturnalia, Saturns, Saturns, which must necessarily be celebrated even by little slaves at the time of the Saturnalia. New Year's gifts likewise must be caught at and the Septimonium, Septimontium, sorry, kept and all the presents of midwinter and the feast of dear kinsmanship must be exacted. The schools must be wreathed with flowers the Flamen's wives and the Adile's sacrifice, the school is honored on the appointed holidays. The same thing takes place on an idol's birthday. Every pomp of the devil is frequented. Who will think that these things are befitting to a Christian master unless it be he who shall think them suitable likewise to one who is not a master, says Tertullian. And the rest of you just think about it. However, he continues. But however, the majority, when by majority he probably he means the uh, Christians who belong to the Greco-Roman world and Greco-Roman churches, but the majority have by this time induced the belief in their mind that it is pardonable if at any time they do what the heathen do for fear the name be blasphemed. To live with heathen is lawful, to die with them is not. Let us live with all. Let us be glad with them out of community of nature, not of superstition. We are peers in soul, not in discipline. Fellow possessors of the world, not of error. But if we have no right of communion in matters of this kind with strangers, how far more wicked to celebrate them among brethren? Who can maintain or defend this by us, the Saturnalia and New Year's and Midwinter's festivals and Matronalia are frequented presents. Come and go, New Year's gift games, join their noise banquets, join their din. Oh, better fidelity of the nations to their own sect, which claims no solemnity of the Christians, no solemnity of the Christians for itself. Not the Lord's Day, not Pentecost, even if they had known them, would they have shared with us? For they would fear, lest they should seem to be Christians. We are not apprehensive, lest we seem to be heathens. Again, Tertullian on Idolatry, chapter 14. Saturnalia, dear friends, was a, an ancient Roman festival in honor of the god Saturn, as the name itself testifies to you, it was held on 17th of December of the Julian calendar, and later it was expanded with festivities throughout, through to 23rd of December. But at Tertullian's time, it basically extended to New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Christmas was specifically placed, however, on December 25th, because of Mithraism, according to many scholars, that some of whom I have already quoted. Here is another quote from James Hastings, and um, this was again uh, digitalized from the University of Michigan, you know, on December 8, 2008, page 247, and uh, pages 247, it's Hastings James, Hastings Ann Wilson, Hastings Edward, The Expository Times, volume 19, 
published by T. A. T. Clark in the 1908. So once again, friends, the truth is no longer hidden from you. It's right there on internet, and you can easily find it if you just do some little research. But to save you some time, I'm just doing this service because it's uh, supposedly the night of the light. It's supposedly the holiest night as claimed by Vatican. And by the way, they have this uh, silent night which they sing in Latin. And I highly doubt, because Catholic Church is not prone to be borrowing uh, from other Protestants and other churches, Christian churches, uh, they are always prone to borrow from paganism indeed. So I, I, I presume that Silent Night that the Protestants also sing, or former Protestants, because again, they are, they are now, now, now all almost, or all, or all of them are now in the ecumenical unity with the Vatican. So I just wonder, and I would just presume that it was the Protestants who borrowed this from Catholics. Whether it was the idea, with the idea that they should, uh, uh, draw Catholics to their ranks and the kind of show Catholics that they also share the same worship of Christ and Jesus or whether they just bored it because the, the, the song sounds sweet and nice, you know I don't know, but what I know is that I wonder how many Protestants are aware that Silent Night is actually a <laughs> Roman Catholic song, you know but again what is now the big difference between all of them? Not much. Just in some service elements and uh, just that uh, Protestants do not worship Virgin Mary and perhaps few other, there are few other differences, but uh, since they all share the same uh, belief in Trinity, uh, that seems to be the main uh, foundation of their uh, current ecumenical unity. In any case, the truth about you know, Christmas is not far away from any of you. All that you need to do is just uh, click several buttons, do some research if you wish, and you'll find the truth. And as Jesus Christ says in John 8.32, you'll know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now, uh, what might be interesting for you, friends, is that since Mithras was believed to have been born out of a rock or cavern that Constantine's mother Helena decided apparently based upon the old testimony of Justin and other unfaithful professors of Christ she decided to build the original church of the nativity over a cave <laughs> was Jesus born in a cave well many improperly seem to think so but the Bible contains some information about the place of Jesus birth Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Matthew chapter 2 verse 4. Oh, sorry, this will be Luke chapter 2 verse 4 to 7. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. Verse 5. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a man manger because there was no room for them, them in the inn. And then in John chapter 1 verse 14, the famous words many of you probably know even by heart, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now whether Jesus was born in a building for humans and they moved to a manger, it is not specified. But what is specified is that he was laid in a manger, which is a place that, for, you know, that uh, fodder like hay was placed to feed livestock such as cattle and sheep. Now, while the gospel accounts do not specify Justin Martyr and the group that he apparently supported believed that Jesus was born in a cave. You see, that's brethren where we get all of this funny and 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 and, and uh, unfounded ideas that are not based on the New Testament. By the way, who told you that there were three magi who came to visit Jesus Christ? And doesn't it say that they came to the house? Go and look into the scriptures. Go and look the the gospel account. Secondly, to understand how many magi uh, came and how many people came to you know from east. To, uh, to worship Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. 
you need to go and lead Josephus. Josephus was the contemporary of Christ and the Apostles. And he, indeed, has left us a record that just uh, across the Euphrates River, it was, Euphrates River was the borderline between Judea and the Parthian Empire, and the Parthian Magi, Magi is from Parthia, came to visit Jesus Christ, and he describes why. He describes who are those Parthians, that there he said many of those of the ten tribes of Israel were actually across the, uh, across, uh, across Euphrates, and they were, they were actually having their own empire. And there is a reason why they came to uh, visit Jesus Christ. It's all well described in Josephus' account. So if you want to know what happened, what happened when, 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 when this visitation came, how many people came and so on, please make sure that you would go and read the account of Josephus. Uh, he is a historian we can trust because, again, he was a contemporary of both Jesus Christ and the Apostles. So, uh, the Catholic Church, in its encyclopedia, the Catholic Encyclopedia, even cites Justin for partial proof of the speculation of a cave birth. And here is the quote from the, from the uh, Catholic Church. About 150 we find Saint Justin Martyr referring from his dialogue with Trifo in uh, uh, line 78, to the Savior's birth as having taken place in a cave near the village of Bethlehem. Such cave stables are not rare in Palestine. The tradition of the birth in a cave was widely accepted. It is reproduced also in the apocryphal, apocryphal sorry, Gospels, like pseudo, pseudo Matthew, at, uh, pseudo Matthew uh, chapter 13, etc., etc., and uh, so it is very disappointing that the Church of Rome actually refers to Justin's statements, which, you know, which have to be referring, referring to an above-ground cave. So they just refer to Justin's statements as, par- as partial proof that Helena picked the correct location with the grotto of the nativity. Now scholars also realize that those who followed Mithraism not only claim that their God was born in a cave, they also believed that he was born on December 25th. Well, what more proof, my dear friends, do you need? What more proof do you need about your misplaced, shall I say, birth of Jesus Christ that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ? Now, while Justin the Martyr was aware of Mithras' legends of a cave birth, those who were part of the Mithras religion were perhaps even more aware of it. Emperor Constantine, who was born in Serbia, by the way, in the city of Nish, he followed Mithraism and he was largely responsible for December 25th indeed. Because, you know, to begin with, the church tried to have Emperor Constantine ban the sun religion and its December festival, but eventually a compromise was made so during the first 300 years of the history of the Christian Church, no one celebrated the birth of Jesus whatsoever. The reason was primarily threefold. First, the date for the birth of Christ is not given anywhere in the Bible. Secondly, in the Bible, only wicked people celebrated their birthdays, which we have the account in both the Old and the New Testament. And thirdly, in the pagan Roman Empire, which was occupying Israel at the time of the, be- of the uh, beginning of the Church and at the time when Christ was born, uh, the, the, in the pagan Roman Empire, there was a common tradition to celebrate the birthdays of the pagan gods. At that time, at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Roman Empire included almost all of Europe and the Middle East. In Rome, the great god was called Saturn. In the middle of the winter, there was a long celebration held in his honor. This feast was called Saturnalia and lasted from December 17th to December 24th. It was called a feast when one ate and drank, gathered friends together, and gave gifts to one another. December 25th was the last and greatest day of Saturnalia, which will be in a few hours. Well, it's almost 5 a.m. here, so in a few hours when we have the sunrise and we have the Sunday, 20, December 25th, 2022, it will be the greatest day of Saturnalia. It was celebrated on, on December 25th. Uh, as a great feast because it was the winter solstice, you know, which occurred 
on December. So during the first 300 years, I told you already this, uh, or I mentioned it perhaps, 300 years of the Roman Empire sun worship had begun to spread from east, that is from Syria and Persia, and reached large, par- large parts of the Roman Empire. Over the ancient Babylon, their friends, people had worshipped the sun, and one of the highest deities among the Babylonians was the sun god Shamash. The most important day in the solar religion was the day when the sun was born again and rose in the heavens after it had been sinking closer to the horizon and the days had become shorter and shorter in the fall and early winter. When the winter solstice occurred on December 25th, it was celebrated with a great feast and Eastern philosophers and mystics preached about the divine nature of the sun and immigrants from the East brought their faith to the West. This resulted in the solar religion getting ever more followers in the Roman Empire, brethren. Then it happened that the Roman Emperor won a great military victory after praying to the Sun God for victory. As a thank you, he elevated the Invincible Sun, Sol Invictus in Latin, above all the other gods of Rome, and in the year 273, of Christ's era, he had a magnificent temple built for the sun. This temple was dedicated when, well, you guess, on the birthday of the sun, December 25th. And barely 50 years later, the Roman Emperor Constantine became an adherent of the Christian doctrine, and he was a, well, supposedly a former sun worshipper, and the new religion presented a problem. Because Christianity was a problem because it, it was threatening to divide the empire. So what should he do, what should Constantine do with the annual festival for the sun? Well, to begin with, the church tried to have him ban the sun religion and his December festival, but Constantine refused. If he banned the popular feast, conflicts could arise between the followers of the different religions. So finally, a compromise was made, just like all of this, you know, all of this uh, nominal Christianity is actually... Uh, uh, is actually formed, founded, established, how we want to name it, on compromise. Compromise. But compromise with what? Compromise with paganism. So friends, you can compromise, yes. You can say, oh, all right, I understand Christmas is pagan, but I'm celebrating Christ. Well, You cannot do it because Christ, he is the God of the Old Testament, by the way. And in the Old Testament, he already established the the, the, the feasts, both weekly and annual feasts, that are to be kept in honor of him. Not in honor of pagan gods, other deities, you know. And so Jesus Christ has already told us what we are to celebrate. And we see later in the New Testament, his church and his apostles celebrating exactly the feasts that he commanded. A compromise. People just love to compromise. When you look at the whole history of the House of Israel in the Bible, the House of Israel constantly compromised. With what? With other foreign gods served by other nations. Before they entered the Promised Land, God told them, be careful not to inquire how all these nations serve their God. Because because of their cults, that's exactly because of their various customs, which are horrible, uh, not only when it comes to religion, but when it comes to sexuality and so on, because of all of those horrible things, I'm driving them out of this land and I'm giving it to you. Well, friends, what do you think? Why do we have in the Old Testament all these various laws and regulations? I don't mean the sacrificial system, which was added later, as it's revealed in uh, Ezekiel chapter 20. It was added later because of the hardness of their hearts. Because the Israelites did not realize that their sins would demand the life of an innocent of an innocent person of an innocent savior who was to come of course later later and that was Jesus Christ so uh, the sacrificial system sacrificing of animals innocent animals was added because of the hardness of their hearts but i'm speaking about the moral law that you find in the book of leviticus uh, and in the book of deuteronomy Primarily, even though there are other laws, of course, given in Exodus and uh, given in uh, in Numbers. Uh, in the book of Genesis, we basically have the history of the early early world. And even though uh, we have, for example, for the day of rest, that God rested on the seventh day. 
So if God rested, what should true worshippers of God do? Should they imitate Mithraism or should they imitate the uh, example given to us in the Bible? Then we find that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Later in the book of Peter, later in the New Testament, they destroyed because of their sin. So you see, sexual perversions were already there, provoking God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. What else do we have there? Well, we have a, when there were, when we had the person who was willingly and willfully breaking the Sabbath and went to cut some, cut some woods. Well, the point is, if he needed help, he would have gotten help. But no, from what we can read from that account, we read the uh, uh, obvious willingness and purpose and uh, a plan to just uh, to just break the Sabbath. He wasn't really going out there out there to get some woods because he was or he ran out of wood and he was cold. No, he went out just to. Uh, 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 provoke God and, 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 and to basically on purpose to break the Sabbath. The result was death. In the Old Testament, what else do we see? We see that all of these various laws that stipulate punishment, even death penalty for those who break them, especially when it comes to sexual immorality. And it's incredible that all of these pagan cults the Israelites adopted themselves when they entered into the Promised Land. All of those pagan cults, dear friends, are usually connected with sexual immorality. Because sexual immorality or fornication is a, a religious obligation or duty of those who worship various pagan deities. Venus, etc., etc. And you see that all throughout the history. But again, why did God give all of those Old Testament laws to the ancient Israel? Because all of those things that he for, that he banned or forbade by, for, uh, that he had forbidden by those laws, all of those things and customs and uh, and and abominations were practiced by the nations that lived in the Promised Land before Israel was taken into that Promised Land. And God that therefore clearly said to do not do those things because because of those horrible customs I'm driving out these nations before you. Of course Israelites did it anyway. And then God sent them foreign powers that destroyed them. Assyrians destroyed the ten tribes of Israel and later Babylonians destroyed the house of Judah or the Jewish kingdom. And I could go on about biblical history still, but uh, I think this is enough information, hopefully for some of you, to use your common sense, uh, connect some dots, and realize, should I keep really, should I keep a custom that is not present in the Bible? Should I keep something that is related to Mithraism, pagan cult of Invincible Son, not commanded by the Bible, but commanded by God, should I do it? And why should I do it? Oh, because the world says that it's the birth of Christ. Well, too wrong, it's not. The world can say that, you know, that right now it's, 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 it's February, but it's not. It's, it's still December, December 2022. The world can say that, you know, my cats are lions, but my four cats are not lions. They're still cats. The world can say whatever it wants. But it doesn't change the reality. It doesn't change the reality that Christmas is pagan to the core. And all those various things like Santa Claus, like uh, giving gifts, uh, Yule Log, uh, uh, something else was, I just forgot totally the Yule, oh yes, the Christmas tree. All those things have nothing to do with Christ. And you can say, so what? Well, so nothing. You can just ignore it. But you're even more guilty if you ignore what you know. You're even more guilty in God's eyes. And if you're going to do it anyway, then it means you're provoking God to anger. Can provoking God to anger bring you anything good in your lives? 
or can it just bring disastrous results? You think yourselves. I'm not going to. I'm not going to think for you because we all have free moral agency, and you just think for yourselves. In any way, December 25th, as I said, was the winter solstice, the day when the sun was born again. Why not transfer the worship of the masses from the sun to the sun of righteousness, the light of the world, Jesus Christ? <laughs> so it was easy to illustrate, you see, the symbolic connection. And if one Christianized the festival of the sun god by instead celebrating the birth of Jesus on that day, perhaps conflict could be avoided. And in addition, many people would be or would automatically join the new religion. You see, so it was just a, a clever a clever scheme to avoid conflicts in the Roman Empire. Scheme by, of course, well, by Constantine the Great. And then consequently the Romans were allowed to continue celebrating the large feast on December 25th, but the sun god was removed and Christ was put there instead. <laughs> Nowadays people say that we should, we need to return Christ and put him back in Christmas. And so, well, you don't have to. It's not Christ's holy, it's not Christ's holiday, it's not Christ's celebration, it's a celebration of Mithraism, so Christ was, has never been part of that holiday anyway. And once Rome had accepted the December 25th as the birthday of Jesus, there was no difficulty for the feast to spread to the rest of the Roman Empire. In Constantinople, they started to celebrate Christmas year 380, in Asia Minor 382, in Egypt around 430, and in Jerusalem around the year 440. And this spread up through Europe, where the sun-turning feast had been celebrated since ancient times in most of the countries. Also, in the far north, something called Yule, and Yule is still the Swedish name for Christmas today, so something called Yule in the north, a midwinter feast, was celebrated. The word, the word Yule, some claim, comes from the Anglo-Saxon Hule, which means wheel, symbolic of the divine sun and its path around the earth. The Icelandic author Snor Sturlason wrote in the beginning of the 20th, 20th century of how the pagan northerners used to celebrate three large sacrificial feasts, among them the midwinter blut, it was the sun-turning feast, when they would sacrifice in order to receive a favorable crop. When Christianity arrived, the ancient northern Yule was Christianized, and ever since then we have continued to celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th. So, from all of this, it should be of little surprise that in the 4th century the mother of Mithras following Emperor Constantine in 326-327 authorized the construction of the so-called Church of the Nativity over a 20 feet below ground cave location and uh, because of its steepness and depth this is a location that would be basically impossible to cat for cattle and sheep to be able to be herded in and out of. Others, you know, have also realized that and properly concluded that Jesus was not possibly born in the cave that Constantine's mother Helena was led to believe he was. And uh, are there any prophetic ramifications to the idea of a deity religious figure being born in a cave. Well, Alexander Hislop in his work, uh, the two, the two Babylons, famous work in, in English language. You can even now download it from internet. Alexander Hislop says, and seem, and seems to think that there is indeed prophetic ramification to the idea of a deity or religious figure being born in a cave. So he wrote, notice, now, in remembrance of the birth of the god out of a hole in the earth, the mysteries were frequently celebrated in caves underground. This was the case in Persia, where just as Tegs was said to be born out of the ground, Mithra was in like manner fabled to have produced from a cave of the, uh, to have been produced from a cave on the, of the, uh, cave in the earth. Justin Martyr, 
It is remarkable that as Mithra was born out of a cave, so the idolatrous nominal Christians of the East represent our Savior as having in like manner been born in a cave. Numa of Rome himself pretended to get all his revelations from the nymph Egeria in a cave. In these caves, men were first initiated in the secret mysteries, and by the signs and lying wonders there presented to them, they were led back uh, after the death of Nimrod to the worship of that god in its new form, the apocalyptic beast. Then, that comes up out of the earth, agrees in all respects with the ancient god born from a hole in the ground, for no words could no words could more exactly describe his doing that the words of the prediction. And we are in verse thirteen uh, of uh, uh, Revelation thirteen. He does great wonders and causes fire to come down from heaven in the sight of man, and he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this Wonder working, his look continues, this wonder working beast called the Nebo, N-E-B-O, or the prophet, as the prophet of idolatry, was of course the false prophet, as the Bible in Revelation 13 calls him. By comparing the passage before us with Revelation 19.20, it will be manifest that this beast that came up out of the earth is expressly called by that very name. And here's the quote of the verse. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived that them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. As it was the beast from the earth that wrought miracles before the first beast, this shows that the beast from the earth is the false prophet. In other words, it is Nebo. Now, if we examine the history of the Roman Empire, says Hislop, we shall find that here also there is a precise accordance between the type and antitype. The old pagan title of pontiff was restored. It was through means of the corrupt clergy, symbolized as is generally believed, and justly under the image of a beast with horns like a lamb. According to the saying of our Lord, Beware of false prophets that shall come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. End of the quote. Dear friends, this is a quote from Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons, that you can download from Internet. The book was published in 1858. Thankfully, it's available now. It's again available to you, and you will be very surprised with all kinds of information on the origin of various Christian festivities that this man brings in that book. It's a little bit uh, ancient English language, so some of you perhaps may have some difficulties to understand it, but I think the overall majority of you would be able to get around that and understand what the man says. So I warmly recommend the two Hislop, the two Babylons written by Alexander Hislop, Hislop, H-I-S-L-O-P. Now, please notice about this second beast of Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw, John writes, another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Well, that's exactly how the current Pope speaks, and uh, every year he does so on this midnight, on this midnight, midnight of December 24th, in the night between 24th and 25th of December. Now Mithras, sometimes spelled just Mithra with a S, so Mithras was a sun god. Mithraism seemed to enter, seemed to enter the Roman Empire about a century before Jesus was crucified. Mithras was believed to have been born out of a rock in an underground cavern. Uh, and you can find that in the work entitled The Origins of the Mithraic Mysteries, Cosmology and Salvation in the Ancient World. It was published in 1991 by Oxford University Press. And uh, this information I we find it on page 36. So therefore, a deity that supposedly came up out of the earth, because, you know, Mithras was, uh, was uh, uh, believed to have been born out of a rock in an underground cavern. And, uh, 
Now, apparently the practice of Christmas caroling had its origins in, surprise, surprise, Saturnalia. Saturnalia. So, uh, you can find an origin of, of, of Christmas carols on the internet that in ancient Babylon, the feast of the son of Isis, goddess of nature, was celebrated on December 25th. Ruckus, parting, gluttonous eating and drinking and gift giving were traditions of this feast. In Rome, the winter solstice was celebrated many years before the birth of Christ. The Romans called their winter holiday Saturnalia, honoring Saturn, the god of agriculture. In January, they observed the calends of January, which represented the triumph of life over death. And this whole season was called Dies Natalis Invicti Solis, or translation from Latin is the birthday of the unconquered sun. The festival season was marked by much merrymaking. It is an ancient Rome, uh, in ancient Rome, that the tradition of the mummers was born. The mummers, they were groups of costume singers and dancers who traveled from house to house, entertaining their neighbors. From this, uh, the Christmas tradition of caroling was born. In Northern Europe, many other traditions that we now consider part of Christian worship were begun long before the participants had ever heard of Christ. The pagans of Northern Europe celebrated the, their own winter solstice known as Yule. Yule was symbolic of the pagan sun god Mithras being born. So, as you might understand, friends, many practices that people associate with Christmas came from pagan holidays, including Yuletide. Now, the 12 days of Christmas originally came from the 12 days of Yuletide, which began at sunset December on December 20th, known as Mother Night, and ending on the night of December 31st, the night of the Oak King, and the Roman day of Hecate. Now, the dates were later moved to by those who keep Christmas. Uh, let me give you some historical background on these 12 nights of Yule from uh, Nordic Wiccan and it was published on internet on December 5th, 2014. So you can find it there. Here is what this blog, let's call it blog, says. Yuletide is perhaps the greatest of all heathen holidays. It's a time of celebration and close family contact that lasts 12 days and nights, each of which can be viewed as a month of the preceding year in miniature. Many of the customs associated with Christmas actually began from heathen Yule rites and customs. Many gods and goddesses are honored during Yuletide, and most Asatruar believe that they, as well as the spirits of the earth and our ancestors, all join us for the celebration. All are our kith and kin, after all. Therefore, many there are many traditions and practices that are traditional to the month of Yule. The most well-known is, of course, the 12 days of Yule. Some heathens may simply book and Yule with the uh, Mother Night and Twelfth Night and not have specific observances in between those days. There are some other heathens who have taken things a step further, pulling inspiration from the Nine Noble Virtues and combining it with candle lighting celebrations like Hanukkah or Kwanzaa. They have come up with a reason to light a candle every night during the Yuletide. <laughs> the altar of Yule on Yule should, be face, should face north. The area is decorated with holy and mistletoe and dried leaves and fruit such as hips and haw, a chalice of appropriate wine, mead or cider, the oak or pine log with up to 13 green, white and red candles decorated with carvings, runes or symbolic or symbols is placed centrally on the altar. This is in this blog, 12 Nights of Yule, Nordic Wiccan, December 5th, 2014. So if you're, if you will have no time to go and check it, well, I've just checked it, I've just read it for you. Friends, faithful early Christians were not keeping the 12 days of Yuletide, nor Christmas, nor Easter, nor any other of these nominal Christian holidays. Anyway, it was because of pagan celebrations related to the sun that the December 25th was chosen to supposedly be celebrated as Jesus' birthday. However, it, as I said, was not Jesus' birthday. It cannot be Jesus' birthday. There is no way that can happen because 
we have ways to prove it from the Bible. And I spoke about that in my other program, so I'm not going to be repeating, repeating myself. But many, many like to celebrate the day of Mithra's birth, as well as have various accompaniments that were associated with the pagan Saturnalia and Yuletide. Now many say, so what? You know, it doesn't matter that the origins are pagan as long as we worship Christ. Well, Christ himself does not accept that worship, friends. Matthew chapter 15 verse 9, he says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And the same thing he says in the Gospel of Mark chapter 7 verse 7. Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, never endorsed anything like Christmas. Never. Even ignoring the pagan elements, friends, Christmas focuses on elements that may be associated with the birth of Jesus as opposed to how he lived and what he will do with his kingdom that is soon coming. Each December it is common to hear that the multitude of heavenly hosts said to the shepherds concerning Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2 verse 10 and 11, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Yes, yes, indeed, most people not only do not realize that Jesus was born in the fall or autumn, probably on one of the holidays, whether it was the uh, Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Tabernacles, but not only that, but they do not seem to grasp that Jesus would be a joy to all people, as all will have an opportunity and a real offer of salvation through him, which is some of what the fall holidays, particularly the Day of Atonement and the Last Great Day, held picture. Because in those holidays, true holidays of God given to us in the Bible, we see the plan that God has and is exacting when it comes to saving all humankind. So Christmas was not an original Christian practice. Although Jesus is a major part of God's plan, which is part of the, uh, you know, that's part of how these churches, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant churches, rationalize uh, for promoting Christmas and Easter. So even though he's a major part, you know, by not keeping the holidays, the true God's holidays, Sadly, Protestants tend to discount or deny aspects of the plan of salvation that the holidays help to demonstrate. All the biblical, biblical holidays have connection to Jesus and to God's plan of salvation, unlike Christmas. Christmas is not a proper Christian substitute, not at all. And Christmas has, again, nothing to do with, uh, with Christ himself, with the apostles or with the original church. So the question once again is, you know, I'm, this is the second year in the row since last year that I've been presenting to you all these facts on Christmas and, 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 and trying to present to you the facts in hope that some of you, at least if not many of you, may just light up, let's say, uh, your common sense and ask yourself, why in the world am I keeping customs which are supposedly Christian why am I keeping customs and doing things that have nothing to do with my Savior, that have nothing to do with my salvation, that have nothing to, to do with God's commandments, but the customs that are based on human tradition. Customs not based on God's commandments, but on human tradition. And why am I following that human tradition? And why am I respecting that human tradition? Who is the, who is the uh, authority in my life, or what is the authority in my life? Is it the Holy Scriptures? Is it God? Or is it some strange uh, 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 custom that originates from paganism that human authority imposed upon me? And among those human authorities, probably the most outstanding one is of that of Constantine the Great, so-called Great. Perhaps you don't even know that Constantine the Great, till the end of his life, held the title Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of all paganism. And that title, to this day, uh, the successor of that title is, 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 is Pope, every Pope. Uh, as you probably know, Popes have several titles. Uh, Vicarius, like Vicarius Fili Dei, which is written on their, on their, on their cap, uh, shaped like uh, fish, which is a symbol of God Dagon 
who is also mentioned in the Bible as a pagan deity. Uh, but among his titles, the Pope has got the title the Pontifex Maximus, High Priest of all the pagans. He inherited that from Constantine the Great. So, for second year in the row, I've been trying to reason with you, friends, by presenting you facts, reason with you with the question, why should you? I'm not even asking why do you, because I know, yes, human nature loves loves presence, there is a vanity, there is this holiday season when everybody is joyous, they spend money, it became just a wonderfully cons- cons- wonderful day for consumption and so on. So I understand why do you keep Christmas, and because everybody does it anyway. But I'm asking you now this year, I'm asking why should you keep Christmas? Why should you keep Christmas? Because the nature of Christmas is anti-Christian. Christmas was celebrated well before Christ was born. Christmas has nothing to do with Christ or his teachings. There is no date of his birth specified in the Bible. Christ was not born in the, in the, in the winter, but in the fall. How do we know it? We know it because before him, six months before him, was the birth of John the Baptist. And we know when John the Baptist was born because his father was serving in the temple in one of the shifts, priestly shifts, that was established back in the Old Testament with King David. So each family was, uh, each family was uh, assigned to perform priestly duties at the temple uh, at specific time. Since we know that John the Baptist's father was from a certain family, and we know when was it that that family would officiate at the temple hall, and then that would just give us a clue when, when, uh, 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 when his wife would fall pregnant, then all that we have to do is from that, and then if she, she falls pregnant, then you add nine months, and then you add six more months, of course, because there is that time that separates the birth of John the Baptist from John, from, from Jesus Christ, and you come to the autumn, as I said, that Jesus Christ was most likely born on the Feast of Trumpets or on the Feast of Tabernacles. In the autumn, because all of God's holidays fall only in autumn and in spring. So it was impossible for him to be born in the winter when the shepherds could not be staying outside on this terribly shivering cold. There is always usually a snow at this time of, of, of the year in, in, in the Holy Land, in the Promised Land. So there is no way the sheep would be outside and shepherds tending the sheep in the, you know, in the shivering cold and the shivering terribly icy night there they are you know outside really freezing getting freeze you know in the freezing weather being cold and tending their sheep i mean that doesn't make any sense that doesn't make any sense even some protestant commentators have given all the arguments against december 25th birth of christ my question remains, the question for that you all need to answer to yourself, friends, why should you keep Christmas? Because everybody does it. Well, again, who is the authority in your life? If you're a Christian, is your authority the Bible, the Word of God, is, or is your authority pagan human tradition? Because Christmas is nothing else but pagan human tradition. So if pagans are the authority for your life, if pagan tradition, if human tradition is the authority of your life, then something is wrong with your Christianity. Because Christ is then not the center of your <laughs> belief, even though you may, you probably think he is. Well, we are celebrating his birthday. We're celebrating his resurrection. How come he's not the center of my life? Well, because he's not, because he did not command those festivals in the New Testament, and God the Father did not. Well, God the Father... As far as I have his research, the God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ, because it says in First Corinthians chapter ten that the, uh, the, the 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 stone that followed Israel throughout the wilderness was him, Jesus Christ. So anyway, he did not command, and he then later said to the, uh, the Pharisees that he came to that they were just totally ignorant. 
that he came, among other things, to reveal to us that he is the God of the Old Testament we read in the Old Testament, but that he came to us to reveal the God that we did not know about, and that would be God the Father. In any case, Christ, when he was still God, before being incarnated, he never commanded Christmas and Easter. He gave a list of holidays that we, that true Christians are to follow and celebrate. When he was incarnated, became flesh and dwelt among us, Emmanuel, God with us, even though he was, so when he was with us, he did not command any other holidays. He certainly did not command Christmas and Easter. He never commanded people to keep the day of his birth. Not at all. Not at all. He still continued with the same holidays. And those same holidays are mentioned in the book of Acts. Acts of the Apostles. So the Apostles continued to keep exactly the same holidays that Jesus Christ prescribed, instructed us to keep in the Old Testament. So, the answer to the why should you keep keep Christmas is it's your choice it's your free choice but if you think that you're celebrating the birth of the of Jesus Christ and that and that Christmas honors Jesus Christ and the apostles and his teachings friends you are deceived that's not the case Christmas has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus Christ let alone his birth but again why should you keep Christmas if you choose to do so, if you choose to spend so much money on the Christmas tree, on Christmas trees and other silly things and be part of this silly season, uh, honoring, thinking you're honoring Christ, meanwhile you're honoring actually other gods, because Christmas tree, for example, is the phallus of Nimrod, the sun god as well. So if you continue to deceive yourselves, that's not going to change the nature of the things that you're keeping and celebrating and you know sooner or later you're going to be faced with a consequence and the consequence is destruction spiritual destruction because the, 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 your, your mindset is being affected by keeping pagan things that have nothing to do with Christianity you bring curses upon yourself you lead your children to love and worship the followers of Nimrod Christmas tree you on the Christmas trees, pagans would, would sacrifice their children to their foreign gods. And you're ignoring that and you're placing those gifts under the trees and all of that stuff. Friends, if you're not serious, if you're seriously want to be Christians who follow Christ, you'll have to give thought, serious thought to all of these things that tell you about the nature of Christmas. And if not, you can just go with the flow and think that it's beautiful that you keep Christmas, it's so wonderful, and continue being deceived that you're honoring Jesus Christ by doing so. So this is the second year in the row. I'm thinking that I've given you enough information on this channel for why should you keep Christmas, to ask yourselves, and perhaps next year I don't have even need, no need to... Uh, once again describe to you the Christmas myths Christmas lies and the origin of Christmas customs uh, you've got now the, enough information that none of you can say we didn't know all that you can say to God one of these days is we ignored the facts or we, we did know but we did not believe or we did not want to believe or we knew but we we decided ourselves to be our own authority and we said to ourselves no we are not celebrating paganism on this day we are celebrating Jesus Christ well your own authority my dear friends is worth nothing just as mine is not worth anything to be you know in your lives or in my lives only the word of God is the uh, meritory uh, and, and true uh, meritory and true authority that you need if you want to be Christians following the God of the Bible so, I'm not going to wish you any Merry Christmas. I'm going to wish you a happy, hopefully happy departure from all of that Babylon and, and, and all of that paganism. And I would much rather welcome you to uh, getting, getting free 
and uh, achieving your freedom from all these customs that have absolutely no connection to Jesus Christ whatsoever. Until next time, goodbye friends.